make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> That reminds me of the very first podcast I ever um, recorded of, of Talk of Politics. It, my dad was, I was doing the story about how I became a Christian. I grew up in an observant Jewish family. And uh, I was in the middle, we were in the middle of like a really thick conversation about theology and our disagreements about like Jesus is Lord. And, and then in walks Phyllis, my mother, and she's like, Ronnie, did you know the trash is piling up? Out? Did, did you take out the garbage? Like... Oh, are you in a... Oh, okay. Well, make sure you pay the credit card. <laughs> like, mom! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers. If you're watching our YouTube channel, I am your political host, Will Wright, and I'm joined by my good friend, Pastor Josh Bertram, who is your faithful host. What's up, Josh? Did you forget my name there for a second, Will? It kind of felt like you did. <laughs> I did. Yeah. We've I only did. been doing this for like almost four years, but you yeah, know, whatever. Yeah. Well, well, uh, today we are joined by my good, my other good friend, um, Corey Nathan, who actually has a podcast show that is all the rave right now. Um, he's making it big, going big time, making tons of money, more so than the 77 cents I just mentioned that uh, we were making on our <laughs> YouTube channel. So, uh, so you, you know are, what, though? Huh, that's 77 that's cents well earned that's what it is josh he's big time in you man he's now that he's a professional I know, dude he's a content creator you know he's big time in you this is how it goes that's right that's right so you know ryan toy review mr beast i'm trying to think of some of the other ones um you know like i'm, I'm coming for you because my kids watch you and <laughs> now my kids will finally accept me as their duly elected father um, yes. who is a YouTuber. Elected. So, so <laughs> hey, <fake> yeah. news. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us, Corey. This is awesome. What have you been up to, uh, these days? You know, 2024, we're off to the races. Uh, it's been a ton of fun. You know, we, um, <clears throat> we had some great guests toward the end of 2023. David Brooks was definitely one of my favorite conversations. He's one of Man. my favorite writers and thinkers out in the public space. Uh, and we had Adam Kinzinger. You know, we we look at each other. The funny thing is, we look at each other's shows, and I have guest envy. I'm like, how do I get yeah. that? You know, yeah, like, same here. I know. <laughs> so we feel the same way. Yeah, yeah, we're in the same spaces. But um, no, that that's really cool. Like to be able to get to 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 talk to guys like Brooks, to talk to guys like Tim Alberta, who I I know is coming on, uh, came on your show. Um, it's just such a thrill, man. Like it's mm -hmm. such a thrill to be able to speak to people who we think are doing great work out in the public. Uh, yes. whether it's in faith or politics or a combo thereof and, um, you know, read their work and then actually get to have a conversation with them. Like they're real people, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's pretty cool. So doing a little bit more of that, you know, we have a, a few other shows that we deal with, uh, that are kind of interrelated, but I'm just excited. You know, I, I was joking around about the 77 cents, but like that's proof of concept, man, that, that I, it, it's it's more, it's symbolic, but it's more than symbolic because it's real. It's concrete. It means that you're, someone is valuing your time and what you're contributing to the culture. So that's yeah. really exciting, man. That's, that's great. Yeah. And, yes. and I, I suppose I should have started uh, also like, what's, what's the name of your pod? Talking politics and religion without killing each other, but don't put the G at the end of talking or killing like that's way too formal. So it's talking politics and religion without killing each other. Talking politics and religion. So can you punch each other? As long as you don't kill each other? <laughs> yeah. That's Is a that great the red question. Line? What, what are the boundaries? I live firmly hey, you know in, the new, in the nuance in the gray area. So, Me yeah, too. I think headlocks, you know, hammerlocks, you know, you bring in uh, Ivan Putsky and maybe like throw him over the back and <laughs> come in with the hammer. I don't know. I, you're, like, you, that's a great question. My counselor, Corey, my counselor told me yesterday that uh, I need to practice nonviolent communication. And I thought, what does that even mean? Nonviolent? I didn't know. And, and then I started thinking about all the microaggressions that I've done in the last, you know, four years. And I just got depressed. You I, know, I'm just. Microaggressions. Uh, this is so uncool of me to say, but like microaggressions strike me as like jinx black magic. It's like anything <laughs> I say can come under the guise of oh, microaggressions. Yeah. There's nothing I can say to that. Like, what am I supposed to yeah. say? 
There's so many. I mean, words, I feel like so I've many... been microaggressed by you now. Yes, uh, that's exactly <laughs> what I was trying to do. So I'm glad that 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 came off. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, one of the, the reasons I wanted to have you on is, I mean, one, just to kind of catch up. I mean, I suppose we could do this outside of the podcast world, but um, nah. uh, but but I, I wanted to get sort of your unique insight on a couple different issues. Um, I mean, being that you and I both kind of operate in the same space, um, I I really appreciate and value your input because you have guests on your show that you know, come from a wide range of different fields, expertise, um, beliefs, uh, what have you. And, and so do we. So um, so I wanted to kind of, you know, talk to you about, you know, or, or for us all to talk about a few, I don't know, current issues that are on the docket right now. Um, you know, one of one of which is, um, you know, the whole Claudine Gay um, situation at Harvard. Talk a little bit about um the trump and his religiosity and um yeah and then maybe just some some reflections on 2024 and and the craziness that is bound to ensue so so maybe maybe we can start first with you know talking about <clears throat> this um this clotting gay situation um so for for those that aren't tracking um, she was the president at Harvard, um, the first um, African woman um, to be the president of that institution. She recently resigned, um, and there has been a flurry of different accusations about the uh, the reason behind you know why she was sort of forced out, if you will. So, um, I guess setting the stage there, what what are some of your guys' initial thoughts on on that situation? Do you want to do you want to tackle that, Josh, or you want me to? Sure. I mean, I can. I'll, I'll throw something out there, and then uh, and then you can respond. You know, it's 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 interesting because if I understand it correctly, a lot of this has to do, at least in the article that we kind of read in preparation for this podcast, has to do with this uh, failure of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, efforts. Uh, so, and, and it kind of feels like it, at least the argument, right. Was that conservative, a conservative campaign or critics kind of, they looked at her and there's this political pressure to kind of remove her from office. And I'm wondering, do you guys feel like that's true? Is that really what's going on that, that it's, it's the, it's the, boogeyman behind the uh behind the you know wherever where does a boogeyman hide i guess in your closet or under your bed but that's you know the, the boogeyman of conservative white evangelical men that have now taken down another another uh hero is that what's going on help me understand will yeah so um <laughs> So there was a big push by a conservative activist, Christopher Rufo, um, who, you know, is is not necessarily any friend of uh, liberals or, um, you know, DEI, critical race theory stuff, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, he um, is pleased that she's, you know, not there anymore. I mean, I think he's quoted as saying, like, you know, her resignation is a victory, um, but it's only the beginning um, there, there are people on both sides of the political spectrum that are, um, opining about the reason behind it. Um, you know, I should also add that she was accused of, um, like having plagiarized a lot of her, you know, previous work, um, which, you know, as the, as the head of a, you know, one of the, the premier, you know, educational institutions in the country, obviously like that, that comes with its own set of issues. I know like when I was in college, I mean, there was a number of different sort of ways that professors would, would determine whether or not I plagiarize. And when I, I think my first year of college, like I had plagiarized something cause I just didn't know how to like write a paper. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that aspect, but then, um, but yeah, but, but, but she was, you know, kind of the product of or I shouldn't say was like uh, it's alleged that she was a product of uh, affirmative action, DEI. Um, but yeah, but but it, it's 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 really it's really weird. Like the left are saying that it's ra racially motivated to kind of push her out. 
um, even Claudine Gay herself is, you know, um, basically inferring that, you know, her, her push out of sort of leadership is, is due to racism. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. And as a, as a, you know, person of color myself, I, I've got some pretty strong feelings about it. I mean, I think that if, if she did plagiarize I think that should be a deal breaker right away because the students that go there would would likely be kicked out if they were, you know, plagiarizing totally right. something. But but as far as something being racist, you know, it's 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 a little bit without having all the facts and details. Um, it's hard to really kind of make that leap, which, you know, folks that are on the on the right will probably agree with me. And, and my fellow brethren on the left are probably cussing me out. Um, be, mm. because I haven't quite, you know, reach reached that that point. But yeah, you know, what do you think, Corey? So I think that there we have a treasure trove of individuals who are not availing themselves well right now. <laughs> you know, I am no fan of Chris Rufo, but I'm also no fan of plagiarism. So I think for those of us who are engaged, I think that it is a mistake to think that just because we largely disagree with an individual and even find that person distasteful, that they're always wrong. They, I don't like them, therefore they are always wrong. Even, even in some of the ways that Rufo has brought some of these issues forward, like the way they have executed their campaign against, um, what is the, the new, new school or something? Not new school, it's um, New College in Florida. Uh, I thought it was heavy handed. I thought it was they 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 were displaying mm. examples of the most undemocratic uh, uh, tactics uh, to, to take over this school. Um, and uh, it, it in fact, as a as a Burkean conservative or even a Buckleyan conservative, I thought the tactics they were using at at New College were were anti conservative. That said. Just because it was Chris Rufo, whether you think he's an asshole or not, he still might be correct about this issue, uh, especially once we dig into the issue, particularly plagiarism. And it it's borne out that it can't be scrubbed by your PR people as simply duplicative <laughs> language. You know, um, uh, in fact, it, it wasn't particularly good duplicative language. You could have gone to chat GPT and found better. <laughs> you know, we were just talking about that. But um yeah. So there, there are a number of intertwining issues. And I think Danielle Allen had a piece uh, not too long ago, within the last few days, I think, that really um, peels back the layers one by one of each intertwining issue. Um, you know, on DEI, I think the excesses, when we're simply doing a, a corporate equivalent of nut picking, bad examples of, of DEI, of, of folks who, who've gone to the excesses, uh, we're doing a disservice to everyone because the idea of working harder to, um, to have a pluralistic society and to really examine our own shortcomings of what we've overlooked individually and collectively. I think this is an important exercise of being a better nation together, being a better community together, right? So yeah. we, we shouldn't allow the excesses of some and the errors of some to disqualify that entire endeavor. Uh, that's a, that's a, a worthy endeavor. You know, so that that's one issue. Uh, whether um, whether uh, Miss Gay was um, was given the job uh, based on diversity initiatives, affirmative action, um, I, I can't say. But I think to uh, to have an overall exercise of giving someone a giving someone an opportunity, giving someone an, uh, a hearing that you might not otherwise have. Uh, given an opportunity to, I think that's that's healthy. Um, and if she, no doubt. It, if that individual uh, can get the job on, if, if once they're in the door, they can get the job on their own merits. God bless them. That's awesome. That's be, that's good for everyone, right? So anyway, I'm going yeah. on a bit, but you can see that there's any number of intertwining issues here, and I think we're when we stay, when we allow for nuance, when we allow for, um, well, that person. I hate them, but they have a good point. I don't agree with that, but I don't – let me think about why specifically I don't agree with that. When we when we stay in that zone, I think we're in a healthier zone to, to uh, grapple with these really complicated issues. So my only 
uh, actual experience with DEI because I've worked at largely small companies and then at churches, they didn't have any DEI, you know, um, requirements necessarily. And my only experience with it has been through some of my friends that work at kind of larger corporations and kind of talk about how they feel like now, again, several of these are very conservative. Um, but one of them was not that conservative and was actually a, a person of color, a minority, but felt like, like they were, they, they looked like they were white even though they're ethnically a minority. And so like they got treated in a way not with the person, not knowing that they were an ethnic minority, they got treated in a way that was like uh, in this DEI um, training that, that really upset, upset this individual. And I just don't know enough about it. Like I don't like, and maybe will, I know that you've, I, I think you've done work in this, haven't you? In your company, and uh, you're on like a, you're on like a board or, mm -hmm. or one of the committees that helps. Yeah. It. So, what kind of things happen in those meetings where you guys are deciding on DEI training or what, whatever it is that you do? How 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 are these decisions made? How is it determined? What should be taught? How it should be taught? How are codes enforced? How is it like, is it like what I hear this kind of draconian nobody, if you, if you speak against, you know, the, the top people now, which D like this idea that DEI is now the trend. And if you speak against this, then you're now uh, buried under a heap of shame. And uh, what, what's actually going on? Cause I, I get stuff from all different sides and I'd rather hear it from someone who actually is involved in it on a, on a ground level. What, what's going on there? Yeah. So, so like when, when you think of DEI, like, well, number one, I'll back up. DEI is not a new like concept. Um, you know, maybe the acronym is new and actually it's, it's, um, it's DEIA or yeah, DEIA now, um, hmm. the A stands for accessibility. Um, so for nice. folks with disabilities or something like that. So, um, so it's not a new concept. Um, you know, the NAACP was heavily involved at trying to find equity um, amongst like different races of people. I mean, Rosa Parks was was a member of, of the NAACP. Um, and so that was, you know, many, many decades ago. So DEI is, is essentially kind of starting from the point of, you know, looking at the demographics of your company and and. And just asking the question, like, does the proportion of X make sense for where we are? So, like, let's say, for instance, you are, you know, in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, predominantly black community. Um, and you're running an organization, you know, several hundred people and 80 percent of them are all white. You know, it's it's sort of asking the question of, like, does this make sense to you? Like, uh, and if it doesn't make sense, then why? Um, because maybe there could be sort of a, a, a confluence of different factors that are that are causing your demographic to look the way it is. It could be from the recruiting, you know, it could be from the hiring practices. It could just be people's own personal biases, you know, um, and the same thing can be said for, you know, if you got a primarily all male um, you know, workforce or female or whatever, you know, I mean, and even like if you're a black company, um, that only has, you know, say one or two white people, like I would even, I would even argue that, Hey, in those companies, you should also be looking at sort of the demographic of, of your folks. Now, I, I, I know that's somewhat risky to say because, um, like black owned businesses are a thing and it's something that people take a lot of pride, at, pride in and they should, uh, because for, I don't know how many generations, you know, this, this country hasn't necessarily been all that great to, to people that look like myself. So, you know, D DI is really just trying to level the playing ground, uh, the playing field. Um, so that way everybody kind of has a chance, you know, it's not necessarily like, oh, you know, that person was a DI hire. So, um, you know, we're going to naturally get a lower quality of, of service or, you know, work out of this individual. It's like, no, it's saying, Hey, like, 
there may be situations where we want to hire, you know, somebody that's LGBTQ, someone that's a person of color, someone that's native, someone that's black, someone that's white, you know, <laughs> like, um, so I, I really think that people's idea of what DEI is a bit construed and every company does it because it's like, it's a good business decision. I mean, essentially if, if, if you want to have a closed thinking environment, um, you will not want to support DEI. But if you want to sort of tap into the creativity, ingenuity of, you know, a multitude of different people, um, then DEI is something that that you should be looking at. But but also like the DEI term is 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 now sort of using the pejorative. Um, and yeah, yeah I, I think a lot of companies would benefit from just changing the name. It's kind of like NASA did it with UFOs, right? Like now they're UAPs, unidentified yes. aerial phenomenon. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just, they just call them UAPs now. So, um, yeah, the, did, did if, you have something to add? Oh, that's okay. So if the principles are good, I, I think that, that they, they apply regardless of what the terms are. Um, I, as a side note, hmm. I'm somewhat ambivalent about certain terms being hijacked. Uh, you know, our, our, our former president is, is really good at hijacking terms like, no uh, doubt. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, now even evangelical is like, like they, they stole it. <laughs> like it's a beautiful word. They stole it. You know, I know, Fake man. News, like all these different terms are conservative. You know, they're, they're up for debate. Anyway, that's a side conversation. What I, I, I was going to ask you, Josh, <laughs> is, when I walk into a church, like in our town, I don't know what the exact Dang. numbers are for Santa Clarita Valley, but I know for our district, we're as much as 30 to 35% uh, Spanish speaking uh, Latino po uh, voters. Um, but when I walk into a church and it is 95 to 99% white, then I'm thinking, man, is so I, I actually had a thought. I had, a, I did have a, a question for Josh because it has to yeah. do with DEI as it relates to churches. You know, so sure. I, I live in a, a district. I'm not sure about Santa Clarita Valley in particular, but our voting district is at least 30% Latino voters. Uh, and when I walk into certain churches and I see 95 to 99% white, I'm thinking, man, is this church really serving our community? So do you, as a church leader, is that something that you're cognizant of and a, and a part of the mission of the church is to serve the community where you are? Or is it just like, hey, as long as the butts are in the seats, we're good to go, you know? Well, that kind of depends on the pastor, you know, and uh, yeah, that depends on the pastor for sure. At the churches that I've been at um, and my church, like we really definitely highly value diversity. It's funny. Will was we were on a call the other night and he's like, yeah, you have a, you, you pastor a black church. And I'm like, and then he's like, yeah, 75% of your, like 75% and we counted like of your congregation would check uh, African American on a, on a form. Um, like several of them are, are, are uh, it's uh, their parents are black and white. Right. So, um, but it's like, I never would have necessarily thought that that wasn't necessarily my goal, but it was this thing in mind where I was like, I have to learn how to minister to people that think differently than me, that look differently than me. And not every pastor does that for sure. Another thing that I think isn't said very often is that the style, and this is going to sound funny, but I think it makes sense. The style of worship is a huge, huge barrier in a lot of these places. Because what you have found is if you like traditional quote unquote black churches and white churches, if you go to the music, the music is similar, but it's different. And the style is different. And people choose churches based on the style of worship. And I, I think that a lot of white people are uncomfortable in black church spaces because of the style, but they may not be able to express that. And if no one's asking them, if no one's challenging them, because like, for instance, at my last church, I would say things like, man, um, if we are going to be diverse, we need to have more diverse music because music is a huge part of what we do. And if every single song 
is, and, and I'm, I, I'm like a victim of this. I don't know. Victim's not the right word. I, I do this. Like I just, Oh, what's the top 10, you know, worship songs. And I go look it up and I say, oh, I'm just going to play the top three, you know, cause I'm just a pragmatic thinker in that sense. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to have my favorite songs up there. I just want to have the ones that are popular, but all the ones that are popular are written by mostly written by white people and, and sung at white churches. And I don't know why that's the case. I'm sure there can be explorations. I'm sure there have been and yeah. good and good explorations. But I do know that churches are the most segregated of all of the areas of our society, almost the most segregated. And I, I maybe it, it, maybe it has something to do with the personal nature of worship and and how we just want a certain style or you want a certain kind of preaching and style of preaching or you know what I mean. And 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 so often. People just get kind of stuck in those ruts because they grew up with it or whatever it is, and it's what they're most comfortable with. You know, I I, I would be reticent to just say that's oh, just because all these white people are racist. Um, certainly, there's a lot that are. Um, you know, but I think that it's probably a stylistic thing. But then again, that's just a gut feeling. I don't have any like real evidence to back that up. I'd have to do some research on that one yeah. to really get that, you know? Yeah. It's, it's almost like, um, you know, what, what churches are more prone to say, play like KJ 52 versus Lecrae. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I would, I would venture to guess KJ 52 has probably played more, um, say before, church starts you know music going on in the background then you would hear sort of like lecrae type music um and it's really really sad but you know kind of on, on on that same on that same thread just just talking about um religion i i i want to get your guys's thoughts on on an article that i read recently um and it's something that's kind of been on the news a little bit in some circles especially the circles that we all run in but um it's a it's an article by the Deseret News um, that um, is titled Most Republicans Think Donald Trump is a Person of Faith. Um, and the article is pretty, I mean, it's shocking, but not necessarily unexpected. Um, there are so, you know, they, they polled a number of uh, folks. Um, they 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 the, the results were, you know, Donald Republicans Sixty-four uh, percent of Republicans think Donald Trump is a person of faith, um, versus thirteen percent of Republicans thinking Joe Biden is a person of faith. Thirty-four percent thinking Mitt Romney, um, and you can kind of you can kind of guess on like how the numbers are switched. So when it comes to Democrats, ten percent only think Donald Trump is a person of faith, and sixty-nine percent of Democrats think that Joe Biden is a person of faith. So I, I I'd love to kind of. I don't know, maybe unpack that, Josh. What what are some of your your initial um I don't know, first first thoughts about this? Yeah, I was trying to think about this article. So so bear with me. So the conclusion of the article as I kind of uh, understood it is the perception of Trump as a person of faith among Republicans is more about his political stance and actions than any kind of tradition, traditional religious participation. And I would have to say, reading that and thinking about that, I would, I would have to say that's true. I would have to say, like, it, it feels intuitively true to me. Like, again, and they've done these polls, and there's been a lot of polls, and polls can be, you know, polls are, are you have to be careful with polls, right? Because they can kind of say, you can find the ones that say what you want them to say. They can be manipulated, all sorts of things. And But I don't think that this poll is uh, – it, it doesn't strike me as inaccurate in that people um, – I they think he's religious because of his stances on things like abortion and uh, same-sex marriage and uh, immigration – and uh, gun control, right? And it's like, and and I and I really do think that that's why people would think that he's religious. He doesn't un, he doesn't know the Bible. He 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 misquotes everything. I mean, if you hear the guy, I mean, before, he, and I know this has been years and years, but I'll never forget when he said, "I don't need forgiveness." 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, wait, I mean, forgiveness is at the heart of the gospel that everyone needs forgiveness, right? And we got Donald Trump, this guy that's, I don't know, I, I could go on and on, but I, I, I don't know what his faith stance is. I really don't know. But if I had to judge it from his words and his actions and all these things as a whole, I would say I don't think the guy is that religious. Now, what does that matter, what I think about Donald Trump? I don't, I don't think it matters all that much, except to say that, like, yeah, I, I, it doesn't seem like the guy, um, he's just trying to get, he's found a people that will support him because he will fight for them. And coming from very conservative roots, coming from very conservative ideology that I basically took hook, line, and sinker most of my life. I've questioned it more now, but but definitely feel myself very much a conservative. Coming from that stance, I can understand why you would like Donald Trump because you want someone who's going to fight for you. And and over the last, whether true or not, over the last eight, you know, 15 years, whatever, I really, I really sensed it and felt it in, during the Obama years because of just the circles that I ran in. It was the first real um, president that I, you know, that I was really following and involved in and, and looking at what was happening. And I just would listen to so many conservative um, publications and and syndicate radio stations and all these things. And, and it would just be blasting this guy because of how bad he is and how he's taking the whole, you know, the whole country um, basically to hell in a handbasket. And I just saw it. I saw friends cry, cry when he got reelected because they were afraid. Existential fear. <laughs> talking about people crying when Obama got reelected. Obama right? got elected, yeah, and people crying when Trump got elected, and I, <laughs> I, I, I experienced both. And I'm like, man, like there was this backlash. I think from people were like, man, we just saw what happened with Obama. Same sex marriage became legalized. Uh, so many things happened. He put these people, very um, liberal people, in the Supreme Court whatever you want to say about that. But, um, and there's this backlash. Totally. I, that's what I think. It was like, people got scared. A bunch of Christians got scared. Evangelical Christians. Trump knew that he could get them. Cause if you can control people's fears, <laughs> you can control them, dude. If you find out what someone's afraid of, you can control them. I promise you. And people, evangelical white Christians are afraid of liberals and they're afraid of what's going to, uh, of where the country is going and what's going to happen to them and their faith and their children and all that stuff. It's, it's fear. It's, and that is exactly what is happening. And it's what I'm trying to kind of prevent in my own heart, like of just being afraid and making choices out of fear. Cause unless you're getting attacked by a tiger and you need to make a quick choice to run away, it's normally not a great idea to make choices out of fear, in my opinion. Well, what, 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 what do you think, Corey? I mean, it is, do, do you think that people consider Trump a person of faith because um, he allowed us to say Merry Christmas again? <laughs> oh, man. Talk about trigger warnings. Um, so I have two separate reactions to this poll, uh, th- this this article that, that uh, summarizes the poll. One is... I need to remember to react to the findings objectively on their own merits. Yeah, to your point, Josh, like, look, they, it's a, it's a relatively small sampling. It's only about a thousand people that they polled. They give themselves a decent error margin of about three plus percent. So take it for what it's worth. But I can, the, the tendency is to read information like that and start to argue with the facts that you're seeing because you disagree with the findings. I don't think that's a very productive way mm-hmm. to process the information. I think it's I think it's worthwhile to process the information, but then if I'm in a conversation, whether it's with somebody like you, Josh, or or one of my friends from church, when you're talking to someone who holds these views that the poll reflects, then that's a different that's a different conversation. Um, so 
we, <laughs> I was thinking before, like the first step is just admitting it, <laughs> you know, like the first step is just reckoning with the facts on the ground. These are the facts. So what is that all about? Now, once I reckon with that, and once I understand if I'm having an individual conversation and I understand their perspective, then I can start to uncover, well, why is that? You know, oh, well, uh, let's take it from the fear perspective that you, you talked about, Josh. You're afraid of liberals. Why is that? Well, they want to do this. Well, who's they? Who, what are we talking about here? Can you tell me a policy, a exactly. specific policy? Can you tell me a specific person? Oh, Biden, he's trying to pack the courts and he's trying to make Puerto Rico a state. And well, has he yet? Or what, what has the Biden administration actually done? Not to argue, but just like to, why? Why is that? Why do you feel that way? What specific policies dig, are we talking dig about? Dig a little deeper. Yeah, to dig a little deeper, part of it is just to get the person to question their own assumptions and to unpack their own fears, if you will, to see, well, maybe I shouldn't be that, that afraid about that. We're, our, a lot of our inclination is to get competitive, to get contentious, right? Is to say, no, that's wrong because X, Y, and Z. Even when I'm reading actual objective information, facts, right? As opposed to relating to it or when we're talking to a person who holds the views that are reflected in that poll to relate to them as opposed to contending with them and trying to shoot them down and throw rhetorical bombs their way to actually just okay why is that why do you feel that way oh that's interesting so what happened like tell me about your life like how did you arrive at that position in the first place you know and, and then then it becomes about a relationship and not about a contest and i think if we have a relationship ironically we're on much more fertile ground to actually tackle some of the subjects, right? So, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, with, well, absolutely. With, with with this particular article, I'm, um, I I actually have some issues with with it. Not necessarily the findings, because um, I think the findings sort of comport with at least my own personal biases and what I feel, you know, about Christians and sort of their allegiance to Trump. But but it's it's more or less the 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 sense that they ask the question because in my opinion i just feel like it's not helpful um with with sort of the current conversation that you know we're having especially as it pertains to christian nationalism and and how trump is sort of connected to it and so on and so forth so um like i i think that that the poll does a does a disservice to the larger conversation about the role of religion in the political sphere, uh, because now it's like, you know, it's it's like who here thinks Trump is is a is a person of faith or a Christian, and then other you know Christians are going to say, oh yeah, see, like most people think that he's a person of faith, and then Trump is probably going to jump on the bandwagon and be like, yeah, look, most Republicans think I'm a person of faith, um, and then that sort of becomes the standard of which. A person is deemed a person of faith, you know, like through a, through a poll. Um, and I just don't think it's necessarily, um, like I said, all that helpful. What, what were you going to say, Josh? Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, uh, you know, all the people around me think I'm a person of faith, if I don't have any faith, whatever I am, because they think I am, right? Mm -hmm. It's I mean, collective it's illusions. Like it, <laughs> well, because <laughs> yeah. well, here's, and, and, and I do, I've harped on this before, but I, I seriously feel like if people... If if someone is confused as to why evangelicals love Donald Trump, and and I feel confused sometimes too, but if they're if they're confused, I honestly think it comes down to the fact that he is perceived, whether it's true or not, he is perceived as a defender of Christianity in both the people he chooses, the policies he tries to um uh enact and and the rhetoric he uses he had he it's like so i i got a theory and i think you guys will like this i got a theory i got a theory about why when uh rob bell came out with a book that love wins nothing made evangelicals more angry than than the idea that love wins uh, ultimately, no, and, and and I know I'm saying that a little bit tongue in cheek, because I, this is not the place to deb debate the merits of hell. We can do that on another podcast. I'd love to do that actually, and look at it and see. But that's not. But my point in in all this is that. So I think P 
people, a lot of times, they, they don't want to not believe in hell because they can't imagine. How is it that that other person can do whatever they want and get away with it? That's not fair. I should be able to do whatever I want, but I can't because I'm, I'm hung by this idea that I have to obey God. And again, I'm not saying that that's everyone's view. I'm, and I'm, that obviously, in my opinion, is not a good view because it's a very selfish view, I think. But I think what happens is the connection there is that people are upset um, and they, they want to defend Donald Trump because he, uh, he actually defends them. He, um, they perceive that he defends them and he's saying things that they aren't allowed to say. And they love that. They love that he can go and say things, whatever it is that he wants. And it's almost like there's this projection onto Donald Trump. He gets to say the things that I always want to say, but I'm too not. Of course, there are people that say nasty things. I'm not saying that. But most of the people that I know, they wouldn't want to offend another person. They don't want to hurt someone else's feelings. They don't want to drive someone else away. But they love that Donald Trump will get up there and go to bat and 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 go fist the cuffs with the quote unquote liberals. I honestly feel like yeah. that's a huge reason of understanding why evangelicals, by and large, love Donald Trump. And I think he knew that. I think if I give him credit for anything, I think give him and his campaign credit. In 2020, the slogan was "He's fighting for us," right? And now he launched his campaign. Yeah. I am your retribution, right? But I, I think that is a. <laughs> I, it's a it's a sociological disease, for lack of a better word. It's a sociological yeah. disease that many of our neighbors even feel like we need to have somebody fighting for us, you know? Yes. But we've yes. had since 1987, probably longer than that, but I, I'm dating it back to when Rush Limbaugh started. We, we've had this cultural training of the left wants you to, the left is trying to, the left, like defining by... Categor- yes. miscategor- mischaracterizing, yes. generalizing, and demonizing. And now it's not just Fox News and Rush Limbaugh or, you know, may rest in peace, whatever my differences with him are, but like a whole industry, <laughs> an entire industry, you know, that has yes. built upon exactly what yes. you're saying, has, understands that um, our brains react to fear and anger the same way that our brains react to crack, that there's this hit Mm. that we get that now not only are we addicted to it, so we have to pursue it more and more, but then it becomes sort of the defining thought pattern of our life, right? So that's why I say the only thing I think that could cure that is it's not even legislation. You know, it's, it's relationship, it's conversation, it's, you know, and that ain't sexy because I can't, you know, e- even if, if my guy gets elected next time, whether it's at the state, local level or at the federal level, even if they get elected, like that's not the answer. As we've seen over the last three, three years, that's not the answer. The answer is on. I think it's sexy, but it, it's uh, it's not. Maybe it doesn't look. Prof- but to me, it's incredibly profound because it's just one conversation with my neighbor that I know I disagree with about guns, that I know I disagree with about abortion, that I know I disagree with about. I don't know, bipartisan infrastructure, although we'll probably never get to that because that's actual legislation. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I totally am picking up what you're putting down uh, because I mean, and, and, it, and I think it's, it's one of the things I really enjoy about doing um, this podcast in particular, because um, of all the guests that we've had on, um, I can honestly say we've had a lot of guests on that, that I would vehemently disagree with um, yeah. their views, their, their for sure organization, you know, and, and, and I think the same probably holds true for Josh as well. You know, for like sure. we, yeah. we like talking to people that we um, don't necessarily see eye to eye with. Um, I mean, and, you know, in an episode that we're going to be releasing here in a couple of weeks, we spoke with the co-founder of the uh, satanic temple, um, you know, and, and, and he, he has an organization that that 
I don't, I'm not necessarily, you know, going to line up and sign up to become a member or anything, but, but, it, but it was, it was, it was nice just having him on, just talking to him, you know, and, and, yes. and, uh, you know, I even at the, at the end of the conversation, I even wished him well and, you know, I hope that he <laughs> increased his membership. <laughs> I like, pray that your converts increase. <laughs> Hey, so it's for for listeners who are listening on oh, on the TPNR feed. Um, this this is very true. In fact, you guys had on the organizer. What is that 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 tour that goes around to churches and creates these Reawaken. events? The Reawaken Re- tour and and um, and and uh, Alberta Tim Alberta wrote about that extensively in his in his latest book, The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. So you had that dude on, but. I, I was just talking to Greg Lukianoff uh, from Fire Free, uh, Foundation of Individual Rights and Expression, and he he shared a story that one of his mentors said, uh, "I want to know who the Nazis in the room are." <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that that dude's a Nazi, but to your point about like putting somebody on who you vehemently disagree with, I, the the way the way to advance our collective understanding is not to suppress speech; it is yes. to it is to have better speech, have better dialogue. <laughs> I just love. I want to know who the Nazis in the room are. <laughs> I'd rather. Dude, that's I'd rather not be, uh, you know, in uh, wondering. <laughs> I do. I I want to make this point though. Be, so the thing. I think the same thing that people think about Donald Trump. I think a lot of Christians they want to think and feel about God in this 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 in this way. They feel like they can't punish the evildoer, mm. but they want God to punish the evildoer, right? <laughs> so they can wipe their the hands Christian, clean. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Totally understand. The Christian version, and I suffer from this uh, desire as well. The Christian version of what goes around comes around. I just want to see it come yes. around. Yes. You know? Yes. So I want to see that... God fry that dude. Yeah. And yeah. think about that attitude though, dude. <laughs> It's a certain form of idolatry. That's what it is. Yes. It's a certain form of idolatry. We're putting other things in the place of God. Or instead of gazing on God and 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 casting our wonder toward God, we're, our gaze is on our enemy or who we perceive to be our enemy. Yes. That, in an ironic way, becomes our idol, right? Because it's the compass by which we we orient ourselves for everything else. Our worship, our political activity, you know, what bumper stickers are putting on our car, you know, how we're just so much of our day to day lives is is our disposition is around this compass that's pointing toward, you know, yes, who, who, who we think our enemy is. So it's uh, yeah, it's preach, man. <laughs> it's an interesting psychology because I really feel like so many like there's this hidden. um. It's like it, it, one of my. It's like we've sanctified this holy war kind of attitude, but we want to keep ourselves. It, it's the same. It, it, it's the same kind of thing where I, w- I want to be careful. It's it's like we like when someone else does our dirty work. <laughs> you I know, mean, I just and and <laughs> so, so, so a lot ahead. of a lot of folks who who identify as Christians they they'd be like texting Jesus and Jesus be like New Testament who this. <laughs> I mean, seriously, seriously, I, 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 I have just had that, those kinds of conversations so many times. And it's like, you got people that are super religious and the whole like religion versus relationship thing. I think that that can get a little wonky sometimes because there are good things about religion and the Bible, you know, the Bible, those aren't necessarily biblical categories where the Bible is like religion is horrible and all this stuff. Cause there's parts of religion, right? The ritual and things like that, that are good. But I do think that religious pharisaic attitude that begins to see people in binary ways. Yeah. That's yeah. It, it, yeah it's it, dehumanizing. It, and I think Jesus brought, yes. And Jesus brought the nuance. Honestly, right. I yeah. feel like he made it so we can actually look at someone and see nuance as opposed to, you know, I don't, again, the old Testament violence in the old Testament, the things that God commanded, that's a, that's a topic for another day. I'd love to jump into that on another <laughs> day. Um, we should like plan a few of these things where we can just start talking about some of this stuff. But I, it's just the whole idea though, is that 
if Jesus is the perfect image of God, right? And in the previous days, God spoke to us through our forefathers, right? In various times and in various ways. But in these last days, what has he done? He's spoken to us through his son. And it's like, so whatever the differences are that we see, you got to look at Christ to understand what that means. And one of my favorite pe- preachers who happens to be my cousin, guy named Greg Ford, I love how he said, it. he said, Jesus is perfect theology. And I know that you can come in and you can, you know, nitpick that and, 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 you know, all, all that kind of stuff. But I think the point is well made that when we want to have theology and understand where, what God and who God is, we need to look to Jesus who said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, who gave himself willingly to be killed. And I just think we don't actually believe that love really will win. And we don't believe that love will actually conquer. We don't believe that. We don't believe it. We still think like Romans or we still think like Egyptians. It's I'm preaching too much, but I just, I see this a lot. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. What what are your thoughts? I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet for now. (laughs) Yeah. You know, um, I think, I think you're, you're right. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe that's your next sermon. Um, um, well, probably not. Cause you know, you want to be mindful of the Johnson amendment, um, and, and all that <laughs> nonsense. But yes. uh, so. I thought we got rid of the Johnson amendment. Well, didn't Trump know, get rid of that? He, he promised to get rid of it, but you know, we're <laughs> oh, still right, stuck right, with right, it. Right. So, um, although, you know, the FBI isn't necessarily, you know, jump through any hoops to prosecute people who violate it. Cause there's a whole litany of, of violations they could choose from. But, um, yeah, so I, I want to, I want to kind of, um, uh, start closing us out by talking about, um, 2024 and the election cycle. So we've, oh, we could we do that in 30 seconds it. or less, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let, let, let's do it. Um, we're we're three three hundred ish days away from the general election. Um, where oh, I can't believe that we will have either a new president or maintain the same one. So, what are what are your hot takes, Corey, on on this year's elections and all the stuff? So that's my hot it? take is that I don't necessarily concede those are our only choices. So I still believe we, we, so we're recording this prior to even the first primary. Uh, so mm-hmm. I still do not believe, even if we go through the primary process, I'm still not, conf- I'm not saying it's going to happen or it's even likely to happen, but I think there's at least an inside straight uh, level of possibility that we'll have at least one different nominee than Trump and or Biden. So Nikki Haley, for example, can pull that inside straight. She has as much of a chance of being the Republican nominee right now as Trump had of winning the election in 2016, which Mm -hmm. is about an inside straight. Mm. Um, Yeah, that's what I think. And there's any number of factors that could lead to that. It could either go through the primary process where she could she could win. Again, I don't think it's a likelihood, but I think there is a a path to it. Uh, And I've seen crazier things happen. Um, We've all seen crazier things happen. So there is a path to it. There also could be a health event. Look, the the main candidates, the prime, the the prominent candidates, the number one candidates in both the major parties are pretty <laughs> up there in age. You know, it's it's not yeah, crazy dude. to say one of them, if not both of them, might have some sort of health event that would mitigate the possibility of them continuing as their party's candidate. Mm. You know, uh, so there there is that. So I want to push back on that. Uh, that, that's my first thought. I, I, what was what was the uh, the context? What was the bigger question? Yeah. So so just um, you know what are, what are some things that you're either looking forward to seeing or you know very skeptical and nervous about um, you know these these candidates as they ramp up their uh, their rhetoric. Yeah. So I, I'm not I'm not I'm trying not to get too caught up in the polls that are coming out today. Uh, I think that there's any number of qualitative reasoning underneath the polls that we're seeing. I'm also, I, I actually, I believe in the efficacy of at least certain polls. Some of them are 
garbage, but there's there's a number of them that I've come to really appreciate and respect if you're looking at them for what they're supposed to be used for and uh, have the frame, the, the, the context, you know, taking in a, a margin of error, for example. So that said, I also think that there's reasoning underneath those polls. So um, I, I'm trying not to get too crazy about what we're seeing right now because you could tease out any number of situations and we all need therapy as it is, let alone trying to th- tease out all these different scenarios that could play out. <laughs> I'll, I'll start looking a lot more closely over the summer, partly because a bigger percentage of our voting public will be paying closer attention. Unlike us, a vast majority of people aren't really paying that close attention. They don't know what Donald Trump said about uh, about the Civil War and that he could have negotiated. He could have, you know, avoided the Civil War with a negotiate. He, they, most people don't know that that's what he said just on Saturday. Like, I could go through a litany of things he said. just So I pay attention to that nonsense, but most people aren't. And I'm curious to see what folks are thinking, especially where it counts. Like California, hate to say it, my vote for president is empty calories. You know, New York, empty calories. Florida, at this point, a lot of folks think it's still purple. It ain't purple. It's red. It's empty calories, what they're voting for president. (laughs) So what I'm curious about is what are people thinking in Pennsylvania, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, North Carolina, Minnesota, uh, Nevada? That's what I'm curious. But not until the summer. That's when I'll start paying closer attention. And if folks are still leaning very much in favor of Trump the way we're seeing now, uh, frankly, I'll start getting nervous, guy. I think it's much more cataclysmic. Our institutions have been weakened. They bent, but they didn't break, but they bent, you know? Uh, so I, I believe in our institutions, especially our judiciary. Uh, but I, I am, anyway, I, I'm not going to get that far down the road because, uh, but that, that, th- those are my thoughts. Yeah. Mm. I think, I think, per, I, I'm sort of with you. I, I think Nikki Haley, um, has probably more than a better chance of becoming president. Um, you know, even even despite if she doesn't get well, if she doesn't get the nomination. You know, she won't necessarily be the R on the ticket. But um, but it, but I I I do think that there are going to be a lot of Democrats that will vote for her in the primary um, because if nothing else, I think Democrats are idealistic and. Uh, we would still like to see a woman president, even if it's Nikki Haley. Um, and the fact that Nikki Haley has taken somewhat of a nuanced, um, you know, view stance on abortion. Um, I mean, a, a lot of it is probably just she's she's trying to kind of play both sides at this at this time. But but I think that she has a real shot at at, um, you know, beating Biden, um, probably more so than, than Trump does. That's just my own personal opinion. Um, I think, I think if, if given, if given the option of Trump and Biden, you know, people are going to come out to the polls because they don't want Trump. Um, but they'll probably still end up voting, you know, R for Congress. Um, and you'll have kind of a similar mix as we did when Biden first got, got elected. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm real nervous personally, just because, um, like Trump, whenever he's backed into a corner seems to, um, lash out even more. And the fact that he's got all these different criminal court cases coming up, um, you know, and then especially if he, if he lost, um, you know, I think that all hell's going to break loose. Uh, I, 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 I was listening to, um, advisory opinions just this morning and, you know, that they, they they were talking about like the Supreme Court intervening, you know, in Trump's immunity case and whatnot and how how different it would be if if it was like Trump v. Bush versus Gore, like how that situation would have played out. Um, I mean, like 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 we all we all remember the Bush v. Gore and obviously there were there were people that were upset, but there weren't rioting on the streets. You know, there are a lot of like really staunchly worded op-eds that were that were written. Um, but if it was like a Bush v. Trump, um, things would have gotten really, really bad, um, you know, ostensibly another Gen 6 event. So, yeah. What, what, what do you think, Josh? Well, <clears throat> there's a couple of things, actually. 
The first thing is that I think it's a real opportunity for us and our two podcasts to in our two podcasts to really like take advantage and be voices of reason and in, in a very tumultuous time. I think people are going to be tired, exhausted of the rhetoric and they're going to want some kind of reasonable conversation. And so I think that that will give a platform and I'm praying and hoping to both our podcasts and podcasts like this that can that that can be voices of reason. The second thing is I'm very concerned about Christian nationalism. I'm very concerned about major denominations and how they have not taken stances that I feel like they should take on on this issue. I'm very concerned. I mean, Donald Trump started saying the only way that I'll lose is if it's stolen, right? He already said that. Um, I mean, he was saying that like, what, six months or whatever before the election. Right. And that's that he, he knew from that point, if he lost, he was going to he was going to do exactly what he did. That's what I think. He started saying it right from the beginning. He's not any different. He's going to keep doing the same tactics. And I mean, I don't want anyone to do anything illegal. I want the right processes, but I am just praying. I don't know what I'm praying for. <laughs> Honestly, I'm praying for God's will. I think, I hope maybe, maybe I, I, I don't know. I know I should sound more sure as a pastor, but I, I'm just like, I, I just praying that God's will is not that we have either of the candidates that we currently have. Um, but <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. And I think um, I I just I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I've heard enough too much from too many people that know what they're talking about to just feel like, oh, it's just business as usual. And so I'm just I'm concerned. But again, I'm not I don't want to live in fear. So I want to I want to try to be a part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And so I think there's a real opportunity Corey, for us and you and and podcasts like ours to to really uh, take our place where where it needs to be. So that's kind of what I think. Oh, that's really cool. Um, well, great. Um, so, Corey, um, not like you know we need to inform our audience, but just for the the small few watchers or listeners that aren't already subscribed to your podcasts, um, when when do you guys air your episodes? We've been coming out on Tuesday nights. I'm trying to I'm trying to get it back to even earlier in the week, Sunday night or or Monday night. Uh, but uh, yeah. So um, do, do you want me to share how people can find me? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So typically it's been Tuesday nights the last uh, the last stretch here. But um, you, it, we're pretty easy to find on all the podcast apps. Just when you're spelling talking politics and religion without killing each other, do the talking without the G talking apostrophe politics and religion without killing each other. And we're up on all the apps, but it's easy. Um, go to our website, politics and religion dot us. So www.politicsandreligion.us, or you can find me on all the socials core at Corey S Nathan. So C O R E Y S is in Sam N A T H A N at Corey S Nathan. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so, you know, with, when you, when you're typing in the name of your podcast, if you have more than one G in your podcast description, um, you've spelt it wrong. Exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was doing, I was doing the math. I was like talking, okay, no G apology religion, but there is a G in religion. So yeah, um, that's so right. that should be your only G. <laughs> well, well, Hey Corey, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you uh, coming by. Um, apologize for any of the technical issues. Um, hopefully yes, we'll, be, thank you. we'll be able to clean it up nice in post-production. Um, and uh, for what yeah, it's worth, just... that's what Lisa was interrupting about. She, she, uh, Lisa has a, <laughs> a, a, a uh, internet dude come in to, so that I can get my own little thing here. So we're not thieving <laughs> off of the houses, uh, you know, but hey, so before we go, so people on our feed can know how to find you. I know a lot of our folks are already listening to your show. Uh, how, how can folks follow you guys? 
Yeah. So, um, our, we have, we release episodes twice a week. Um, so Tuesdays also, apparently Tuesdays, sort of the, the main day for religion, polit- political, um, podcasts out there. Um, we also release on Saturday and, um, people can find us pretty easily. Faithful politics, um, uh, podcasts. Um, you can go to our website. Um, it's just faithfulpolitics.us. And I mean, I guess we could, you can put the www in front. I don't. I don't know. Like, people still say that, and I don't really quite understand why. Because like, that's. I've noticed that when I don't put in uh, politics and re- the www, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, so, so like, I don't know. I don't know why that is. I because that's that's what I'm going to benefit from working with this digital dude <laughs> on the new show. So. Yeah, I'm like, like all of us, we've been World Wide Web for long enough, right? That, that yeah. should be implied uh, that we don't need to say that. So, yeah, faithfulpolitics.us. <laughs> um, and, you know, be on the lookout. We are coming out with a uh, five part um, audio documentary narrative about Christian nationalism. Um, it's, uh, it's designed to really um, kind of provide sort of a, a, a brief glimpse of Christian nationalism and all of its um, components. Um, the um, the first episode will be about um, this idea that America was founded as a Christian nation. The second episode is all about, you know, the church state separation. Um, the third episode is, is all about the unfortunate misuses of religion and the Bible to oppress native and um, African Americans. Um, the fourth is all about Trump. Um, so the evangelical relationship with with Trump and then um, the the fifth episode is 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 really focused on, you know, making the argument that not all Christians are crazy. Um, <laughs> so I'm 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 a, I'm probably a little nice. bit more concerned about the last episode because uh, I, I feel like if you if you listen to the first four, you're thinking, boy, those Christians are really out there. So, so the, the fifth episode is sort of designed to, um, hopefully combat maybe some of those misperceptions. So, um, yes. Yeah. And anything you, you want to add, Josh, before we sign off? No, just thankful to be a part of all this. Awesome. Well, if, if you've made it this far in the episode, um, thank you so much for stopping by <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, make sure you keep your conversations, not right, not left, but up and we'll see you next time. Take care.